basic series hair and makeup take one. I am on a time crunch, so you're not getting any bloopers this time, he says ironically. You'd think this would get easier. It doesn't. I can't, I can't memorize lines. I just can't do it. I have to read everything. All right, basic series hair and makeup take five. Hi y'all, welcome back to my channel. Today we're continuing with the costume renderings basic series. I'm so excited to have the time to really get into each step of the process with you in full detail. Today we're gonna be doing makeup and hair details and we're gonna be primarily using watercolor pencils. If you don't know what those are, stay tuned and I'll show you everything about them. I don't use them the traditional way. So let's get into the demo. All right, so I'll start first by explaining what a watercolor pencil is. So a watercolor pencil is a pencil whose lead basically behaves like a watercolor when water is introduced to it. So as you can see here, I'm just putting in some swatches of color, this pink pencil, and I'm gonna do this purple pencil too. And I'm just gonna blend these two together. Uh, one of the other tricks with these is to really sharpen that point super, super fine so that it can get into the grain of the paper and be smoother in general. So what I'm doing here is I'm just adding the water, showing you that you can really blend and move these around as much as you possibly want. They basically act like a watercolor. I don't use them for this, and you can kind of see why when we're getting a little closer into the shot. The pencil marks actually remain through underneath them. You can't use them exactly like a watercolor for like a full-out watercolor painting. Also, if you're going to do a drawing and then try to turn it into a watercolor, it just kind of muddies everything up, and it just, it isn't pretty. So that's not how I use them. Um, I don't use them with water at all. What I've found is that the lead is much, much softer than a normal colored pencil. And what I do with them is I sharpen them down to a fine, fine point, and I just feather them lightly, lightly, without much pressure at all, over a marker rendering. And what that does is that just allows me to kind of blend the colors together. If you remember from last week, this is the girl whose skin tone got all streaky because the marker was just a little too dry. So what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to augment that with this sand-colored pencil. And I'm just going to spread this all over her skin tone and just try to even everything out. A good technique here that I'm using is um, something we talked about last week with sculpting the form by using darker colors around the outside edge and blending into a lighter highlight in the center. It really creates a more cylindrical object. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying everywhere there's a curve to just make it a little bit deeper in color and blend it into a lighter color towards the inside. I should note here, I'm switching between several different colors of tan just to really give a richness of skin tone to her. Um, also to deepen the areas uh, where it would be naturally darker in the shadows and just to support the underpainting in general as well as the skin tone. I'll make sure to put a list of all of the colored pencils I use in the description below, similar to how I do with markers. I'm using several different brands here, so some of them have names and some of them just have a number. So just really check that out if you really want to use those. I have just used colored pencils that I've collected over the years and they all just go into a big pile separated by color. So I just grab and go. I'm just going to rinse and repeat on the skin tone for each of these ladies. I'm using a corresponding colored pencil to the marker skin tone that I laid down in the first place. So with this step of the process, what's really great about the colored pencils is that you can get a finer point into some of the facial structures. So this is your opportunity to really, really start sculpting that face and start sculpting in the expression prior to putting down any makeup.
All right, I'm about to start in with the makeup. On a lighter complected individual, it's always nice to throw in a little bit of rosy pink in the pulse point, similar to how I talked about with the underpainting using the ballet pink marker. In this case particularly, with this marker, the ballet pink just didn't shine through as hot as I wanted it to for the time period. So I'm just really, really enhancing all of the rosy pink fingertips, the rosy pink on the decolletage, and cheeks. Since this character's shoulders are so exposed, I love to just make the shoulders a little rosy as though they've seen a little bit too much sun. It just helps pop her off the white paper a little bit more. Alright, here's the crazy makeup I promised. So this is actually based off of a design I did where we wanted to contemporize the Elizabethan aspects of the show. So we opted for large, bold, bright swaths of makeup across the actor's face. So now you can see the reason why I left the voids there on the face. It's so that I can get a clear, clean, crisp version of this marker color and not have to actually fight the underlying skin tone. I wanted these to be bold, so the easiest way to do that is to let the white of the paper shine through. Going back in with a darker marker just to start enhancing that bone structure around the eyes. I wanted to give her kind of a menacing glare, but with the Elizabethan period, most women would shave or pluck their eyebrows out. So I didn't want them to have eyebrows, but I still wanted to have emotion. So I had to put in those little skeletal bits of muscle. All right, so for our lady in the middle, I've opted to not go in with another marker and rather sculpt the face using a colored pencil. I'm going to do this with our lady with the blue makeup as well. I just wanted to really enhance the blue makeup even deeper with the marker. As you can see, I'm bringing in a couple of different colors into this yellow makeup to really just sculpt the face as I've kind of been talking about. And I'm going in and adding a bit of a smoky eye with a pencil slightly off from her skin tone just to kind of give the makeup a little something more around the eye. So up next is lips. I love doing lipstick on our characters. What I have always found is kind of similar to how you would apply makeup. You always start with a darker lip liner than the color that you want the lip to read and you use that on all of the areas that are deeper on the lip like the crevices around the edges etc and then I go in with a lighter brighter color right in the middle of the lip and try to maintain a little bit of a white highlight just so that they appear glossy and wet and full. For getting into the lash area and the definitions of the eyes, I go in with a micron pen and a white gel pen and I just line the eyes with that micron pen. It has a super, super fine tip so I can really get in there. And I use the gel pen with a really, really fine tip to go in around the pupils and create the white of the eye. Sometimes I get a little sloppy with my markers and my colored pencil or when I'm painting the iris in and I just need to clean it up. So that white gel pen is going to save you. It pretty much goes over any medium you want to use. All right, let's move into the hair now. So hair, and I'm doing three actresses with black hair, but varying colors of black hair as far as warm and cool tones. Black hair is one of the things that people have the hardest time to render because it really is about the differing shades of black, and that seems a little scary. So what I'm doing here is I'm laying in actually a warm gray, and it's I think the 80% warm gray. And what I'm doing with that is I'm actually leaving a couple of voids and places where I want the highlights to be. So like anything else on the body, it's going to be where the light source is hitting it is going to always be the lightest and where the light source is not hitting it is going to be the darkest. Uh, with black hair specifically, there's a really high shine to it. So you want to make sure that you leave a lot more white voids than you would say doing blonde or brunette or red hair. Like I said, these women all have three different tones of black hair. So I'm going in on our woman on the right with a dark brown marker and I'm just adding that in to go under the black to give it that in the sun brown hair showing through black kind of quality. I'm going to do the same for our woman in the middle and then the difference between their hair is the texture as well as the amount of black that's applied. So our 
woman on the right, she's more of a dark brown, almost black hair. And that means that I'm going to put a little bit less black than our woman in the middle. On our woman in the middle, I'm going through because her hair is textured with some nice like curly Q style lines with a black marker. And on our woman all the way on the left, I'm going in with the black marker in more radial streaks because her hair is actually wrapped and rolled around some sort of form. An important note that I've discovered when rendering hair is that it's not crucial to do every single hair in a brush stroke or a pencil stroke because it just ends up looking over rendered. So rather look at the shape of the hair and look at the shapes of the highlights and the shadows in hair and you'll notice you don't see every single hair follicle. Instead, do patches and streaky patches that can kind of stand in for the textural qualities of the hair. With our woman on the right, I really want this hair to read as a dark, warm, black-brown. So instead of painting it all black, I'm actually going back in with this dark brown over all of the areas I'd already painted and just layering it in so it really reads as just a beautiful, dark, rich, warm black-brown. I'm also going in with a really finely sharpened black pencil and just kind of creating a little bit of a hairline and some wispies. Um, this is one of the best things that you can do is go in with a colored pencil rather than a marker because you can create those tiny, tiny, tiny hair follicle wispies. I'm doing the same for our woman in the middle and the same for our woman on the far left. I'm just adding in a few final makeup touches and I think we're done with this segment of the process. That white pen, truly. The white Milky Gel pens from grade school are the absolute best and a Micron pen with the finest tip you can find, those two things are going to be your best friends when rendering tiny details. I really can't stop myself. I see problems, I go in, I go in. One of the best tricks you can also learn is to really just take a step back from your rendering. Walk away, eat lunch, have a glass of wine, come back to it and see if those problems still annoy you. If they do, fix them, absolutely. But nine out of 10 times, you're gonna forget what problem you saw, or at least I do. Do you remember how I said I was nearly done with the rendering? I probably should have stepped away and had that glass of wine like I talked about. I just kept finding areas I wanted to keep working on. But ultimately, I don't have a timeline on this, and I'm doing this for you guys, so I want to make sure it looks great. Alright, there we have it. This is the finished hair and makeup and skin correction piece after all those fiddly little touch-ups. Thanks for watching today. If you want to see any more costume related content or any more of this series, go ahead and click on that subscribe button. And while you're there, check out the other videos. I have conversations with industry professionals and videos of full rendering design process from start to finish. I'll see y'all next week. We're going to be getting into the next step of this rendering. The next step is fabrics. This is going to be a doozy of pattern, shine, and hard to render materials that people have been asking me all about. So I'll see you next week. Bye.